everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so happy to be here with Kira. She's a functional nutritionist specialist, and she is a firm believer in the healing power of food. She's going to talk to us today about ways that we can improve our health when dealing with toxin exposure. Hi, Kira. Uh, Hi. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so how did it all start for you? Oh, it was a journey. So I kind of came out of the womb having health issues. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> I had digestive issues from birth. And as a kid, I just remember being hunched over the bathtub, always having stomach pains, foods never sitting well with me, bloating that I started joking about in high school and college, like, oh, I look six months pregnant and just kind of thinking it was funny, but knowing mm -hmm. that something maybe wasn't quite right. Um, so for years, I mean, well into my 30s, I was dealing with chronic digestive issues. And I had seen every, every doctor, every specialist, run every test, tried different medications, and nothing worked. And finally, someone just said to me, what about your diet? And quite honestly, I didn't make the connection. I mean, I was completely ignorant. And I know that doctors in the past had handed me little sheets and said, you know, try cutting out caffeine, try cutting out tomatoes, spicy foods, citrus. And I had done all those things and it didn't make any difference. So I, I guess that's why I just didn't think that food was the answer. I figured if food is sold on grocery store shelves, it's fine to eat, right? Like, why would you be selling something that I shouldn't be eating? And so after someone said that to me, it kind of stuck in my head and I started doing just my own research, looking through books, Googling things, um, watching health documentaries, and it almost became a bit of an obsession. And at that time, I was a middle school teacher. I was in my 30s and I decided to go back and get my master's in health and nutrition education. And from there, I mean, it was like going down a rabbit hole and it still hasn't stopped. I got interested in functional medicine when my husband got really ill and I realized the body just doesn't start creating disease on its own. Something triggered it. And yeah, I'm still on that journey. Yeah, interesting. And you said something very, that's very true. It's like sometimes we don't look at what it's outside of the, we don't look outside of the box. We just feel mm -hmm. like, if something is wrong, it's something that everybody already know that exists. Nobody looks into different causes of it. And we just learn how to deal with the exposure or with the symptoms. It becomes the new normal for us, right? Yeah. And, um, and also, um, what you, you mentioned something at the very end about um, how something triggers right? The triggers that you don't believe the body, it's supposed to create diseases on its own and how things are triggered. So what do you believe are those triggers? I think there can be several things. So there's obviously environmental toxins, things that we're constantly bombarded with, whether it's chemicals in our homes, it's toxins in our home, it's people spraying um, stuff outside on weeds. And then the foods, of course, are a form of exposure. And I think those are the big things. And then of course there's the genetic component, which people think, well, I have this gene, therefore I'm going to get this disease. But I think they're not realizing that it's those toxic exposures that actually turn on those genes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said something that we say ourselves and pretty much everybody we talk to is you got sick yourself just got sick and tired of being sick and tired, so to speak, and went on a journey. And the journey probably will never end because, as you said, we're bombarded by toxins. Um, are you feeling much better today, I hope? Oh, yeah. 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 And that's the thing. It, it has been a journey because you, yeah. you start with the food. And then you start realizing, but wait a minute, look at my beauty products. What am I putting on my skin? Yeah. And then it turns into, but what are the pans I'm cooking my food in? And wait a minute, I'm outside spraying Roundup on my weeds. Is that really the best thing to be getting exposed to? So it is. It's, it's a journey because you keep realizing more and more things need to be cleaned up. Absolutely. Yeah. So was this journey overwhelming for you? Or is that something that... It I'm not saying it was pleasant, but at least it was something that you're looking for to get the answer that the overwhelming feeling, it was just not there. 
Yeah, I don't think it was overwhelming for me. I mean, it was frustrating, absolutely, not knowing what was causing my illness, why I always felt poorly. But when it came to making those dietary changes, I guess, I guess there were moments where it felt overwhelming. You know, do I do this? Because there's so much nutrition noise. Am I supposed to be gluten-free? Is it okay to eat organic gluten? What about dairy? Is that an issue? Is raw dairy better? And so there were always questions in my mind about what's best, what's okay, what's not okay. But I mean, like you both said, it, it has been a journey and I've learned what things work for me. And I think that was really a learning experience is what may work for one person is not going to work for me. Yeah, we see that too. The neat thing is you have gone down that journey and maybe a few of those items uh, may not work for other people. But I think in general, just the awareness and the tips, this is what's great. And thank you so much for sharing it. Is we uh, were speaking to somebody else about, you know, sometimes we rely on, let's say, the government or some book we can read or something uh, coming from the top down. But it seems like this movement is really about coming from the bottom up. It's people like us just sharing like, hey this is working for me. There's nowhere to go to find this information. There's nobody really doing anything about it. So yeah, thank you so much because um, the toxins in the home is what we're really uh, focusing on. And it's all a part of a big puzzle. Uh, we spend so much time indoors, um, working from home, sleeping, just sleeping alone, right? And that's where a lot of this stuff's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And and like you said, it's so important because I talked to Faye about it, but yeah, um, there are definitely toxins in our homes that people don't realize at all. I mean, don't have the slightest clue what they're being exposed to. And of course, food is going to tie into that because when you're so overburdened with those toxins, that's where disease comes in. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because um, as you're saying, everybody's different. So something that is very you know, that's good for you might not be so good for me. And when people do the, those diets that they all do the same diet, expecting the same results, they don't understand that there's a lot of different factors around everybody that will make things work differently. So for example, the capacity that your liver has to detox from exposure and how people can never lose weight when they exercise, they eat right, they do everything right, and but they can't lose weight. Mm -hmm. Would you please talk a little bit on that topic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a sore spot for me because I have so many clients that come to me saying, well, my friend, my neighbor, my cousin told me I should try this diet. They lost so much weight or they felt better. Or their autoimmune disease went into remission. Didn't work for me. It's because we're all so different. I mean, Sure, there are components of things that I can tell all people to do. Eat the rainbow every day. Cruciferous vegetables are wonderful for detoxification. But then again, you can have issues with cruciferous vegetables, so those may not work for you. I think it comes down to learning to really listen to your body, understand the basics of nutrition. Like We all need the basic macronutrients, right? We need protein, we need carbohydrates, we need fats. Now, how those go into the body that's dependent on you. So people really need to listen to their body. And what I mean by that is take note of how you feel after you eat certain things, whether that's one week keeping a food journal, but let's say someone tells you, okay, you need to be on the keto diet because that's been all the craze for a while. You might not feel well after eating those high fat foods. Your stools might change. You might notice things. Maybe it's the fact that you're not absorbing or digesting or absorbing fats well, you might need to add a supplement in for that, or your body is telling you right now is not the best time for you to do this. You don't feel well on it, so why are you continuing to do it? Maybe in a month, maybe in six months it'll work for you. And then it's looking at the little things that are happening in your body. Hmm, I started getting headaches after I had dairy, and I noticed every time after I eat ice cream I get a headache. That's the body telling you this food is not working for you. Or every time you eat beans, you start bloating. Try soaking them, sprouting them, that's fine. But if you're still bloating, that's your body telling you this food is not ideal for you. So I think the most important thing is not listening to everyone else around there, trying things and seeing what makes you feel better or even what makes you feel worse. Because then again, that's your sign. Don't do that if it's making you feel worse. I'd like to ask you a question. You mentioned um, the pots and pans and maybe the store. So 
there isn't a lot of information around, uh, and we're all trying so hard to eat better, but I don't see a lot of information around how to store better, um, how to use better utensils, pots and pans, what type of material. So what um, tips and tricks do you have as far as preparing the food in what and storing it in what and uh, things like that? Yeah, it, it's funny because I tell people cheaper is not always better. And a lot of times that's what I'm looking for. I'm not going to say you should go out and buy the most expensive cookware or the most expensive storage. But if you're buying something at the 99 cent store, it's probably loaded with chemicals because it's the cheapest to make. So when I'm looking for cooking, stay away from things like Teflon. I mean, that's the number one thing. If you can avoid Teflon, you're going to be avoiding toxins. Um, I mean, stainless steel works. Uh, there's a couple other companies out there that really pride themselves. I'm trying to think of the names, but I can't off the top of my head. But really the one thing is, is if you're cooking in Teflon, at least move away from that. Uh, go to cast iron. That's my absolute favorite. And then as far as storage, just avoid plastic. That's a big one. I don't even care if it's BPA free. You're still getting toxins in there when you're warming it. By all means, don't microwave it. <laughs> um, but store in glass if you can. It's not that expensive. Go out and get the Pyrex glass containers. That's my favorite way. Even with cooking utensils, I'm going to say go with wooden utensils if you can. I don't have any issues with the silicone. Um, but I think those are the, the biggest things because I see so many people still cooking in Teflon. And then unfortunately, over time, they get scrapes in them. I mean, those of you watching, if you go look at your Teflon and you see little marks in it, that means you've pulled up some of that Teflon and it's gone in your food and you're ingesting those chemicals. Yeah, that's so true. And when you help your clients, usually how long do you see that it takes for them to kind of recover? Um, do you have a special diet for special things? So for example, uh, we were talking the other day about mold exposure mm -hmm. and how you have a special diet for people that have been exposed to mold. Yeah, it, and it varies again. It goes back to that biochemical individuality because someone may come to me and say like, I've tried these five diets and they didn't work for me. Then we need to troubleshoot from there. Um, but yeah, if someone comes to me with autoimmune disease, more than likely, I'm going to say, let's get on some autoimmune paleo, paleo protocols, try that for six weeks, reintroduce food, see how you feel, see how your antibodies look. If someone knows they've been exposed to mold, then absolutely. We're going to look at a low mold diet, um, which a lot of people are not familiar with. They come into us with mold. And when I say us, I also contract part-time with a functional MD who specializes in mold toxicity. So that's where those patients come from. And they have no clue. They just think I need to get rid of the mold in the house. I need to clear the environment and I'll get better. But there are different components. And part of that is, again, the diet. So definitely a fan of trying different diets to see what works for each person. But yes, with individual diseases, like someone with IBS, we might try a low FODMAPS. Someone with autoimmune, let's try uh, autoimmune paleo and things like that. But it goes back to individuality. So I hear this word a lot, and it's even in our workshop, detoxing. So can we talk a little bit about mold? Because that's a real hot button for us right now. Um, because it, we went through that journey, and now we're in the journey of... Um, potentially detoxing from the mold because Fernanda was the one um, in the family that was severely affected by it and showing all of the symptoms. So um, what does that journey look like and how do you detox from mold once mold, I guess it's entered your body, right? Maybe your lungs, it's in your yeah. blood. What, where does the mold go inside your body? Everywhere, sadly. I mean, it really can go everywhere and, and we've seen that. Um, but I think as far as detoxifying, there's, there's three things. Um, first is getting out of the environment or cleaning up the environment. Because if you're continuing to get exposed, you're never going to get better. Yeah. Um, second is probably taking some supplements. You need binders to pull that out of the body. And then the third is the diet. So with mold, there's usually yeast. I mean, they, they go hand in hand oftentimes. And so if you're feeding yeast, then you're feeding mold and you don't want to do that. You want to try to starve it out as much as possible. So that's avoiding sugars. It's avoiding high starch vegetables. Um, it's avoiding anything that's going to turn to yeast in the body. So just 
simple things like not even eating high sugar fruits or not eating them alone, making sure that they're paired with a meal or with a little protein and fat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's great information. Because sorry, I was gonna say, what are what are binders? I've hear, heard that a lot. We haven't gone down that path yet. What, what, can you explain what binders are? Or- yeah. So. Um, Binders are things like activated charcoal. That's probably the most common. It pulls out toxins from the body. So, I mean, you can see in all these juice bars now, they're getting fancy and they're having charcoal water, charcoal milks. I think charcoal is a great binder, but the problem is it truly binds everything up. So if you take it too close to food, if you take it with medication or supplements, it's pulling that out of your body as well. So it's not anything that I would want someone staying on long term because it is, it's pulling out the nutrients from your body and then that's leading to a whole host of other issues. But in the meantime, if you're exposed to some type of toxin, or honestly, this is my favorite hack, if someone has a virus in the house, take some activated charcoal to get it out of your body. Thanks. So I also heard that with the binders, the problem with the binders and when somebody do, they when they try to do that alone without any, you know, what we bought, Without a specialist help, what could happen is you could actually bind and keep that in your body. Or as you said, you could bind it and bind other nutrients that you need. So this is something that should be um, done with somebody that knows the protocol, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's such a tricky one. And it reminds me of heavy metals. You can actually do a lot of damage to your body if you don't know what you're doing and if you're just Googling things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this is great because we all Google. We all trust Google. You know, Doctors Google. They have done that to us several times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I Google. I still Google stuff. I'm going to own that. But (laughs) But how do we put all that information together? It's where it all comes down to you. So having that knowledge, I think, is very important but also knowing who to go to when you have that problem. So you can have a more educated conversation. Yeah. Like you can't have this conversation with the, you know, Western doctor. It, they just, not. Yeah. I had that experience and it was not fun, like totally judgmental from the beginning to the end. But when you talk to somebody like you, you know, a functional special a medicine specialist, you know exactly the protocol. You have seen cases like this, and I think you're more capable of helping a patient from the beginning to the end, re- getting better results. Yeah, and, and the thing is too, is those of us that may not have certain specialties or it's out of our scope, we know who to refer to, or we know who to go to to get you those resources, because the clinic I work in, there are so many cases of mold toxicity. It's unbelievable. And they've all been brushed under the rug. They're being told by everyone, mold is normal. It's not a big deal. We're exposed to mold all the time. But in reality, we're a society that's getting sicker and sicker. And sure, there are other forms of toxicity like we already spoke about, but mold is one that's really not understood. And when people have tried multiple protocols for everything out there and they're still not getting better, you want to look at mold. Yeah. Would you please talk a little bit about obesity? And I have a hard time with that word. <laughs> so I'm going to let you say it. Obesin, o- obesity, obesogens. You got it. Obesogens. Okay. You got it for obesity. Obesogens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these are, it's hard to explain. It was a term that was coined a while back. Um, I don't know if it would be in a dictionary now, but it basically means chemicals that alter your metabolism. So these are foods that essentially make people fat, um, toxic chemicals. So things, when you're looking on the back of a food label, if you don't know what it is, that's probably an obesogen. I mean, in reality. So in order to avoid those things, I just tell people eat what's found in nature. I mean, truly that's the easiest way people complicate nutrition so much. If you want to avoid obesogens, Eat things that you can hunt, that you can fish, that you can forage, that you can grow in your backyard. If you can find it outside, then you're in the clear. If it's something that's made in a factory, if it has multiple ingredients, you don't know what it is, loaded with artificial things, those are going to be your obesogens. And yeah, they absolutely contribute to obesity. And then they're going to lead to chronic illness and all these diseases that people think just popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. 
And also, I think another very important thing is I hear that a lot from some of my friends that, oh, eating organic, that's not in my budget. Um, and I think we need to have a switch in our mindset mm-hmm. about how much does it cost to be sick? And I can speak for that, right? How much did it cost me to stay home, to be laying on the couch, not being able to get up early, um, being dragged out of bed at nine o'clock in the morning with zero energy? And when we look at the patterns, like how we eat, I think that's the clue. Like, where's your food coming from? What is, what is your food eating or drinking, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, sure. Initially, it's, it's kind of a shock to the system when you go to all organic or even as you start switching over your beauty products, your cleaning products and all those things, it is more expensive, unfortunately. It's backwards. It should be cheaper because there's fewer ingredients. But like you said, in the long run, it's actually going to be much more cost effective. And I don't think people make that connection when they're investing in their health, whether it's going to organic, whether it's working with somebody that's trained in functional medicine, whatever it might be, that's helping you get better. If you don't do that now, then what happens in 10 years when you're really ill? What happens when you need to stay in the hospital for a week? What happens when you need surgery and those medical bills add up? It's so much cheaper to just start small. Even if that's following the dirty dozen, for those that don't know, the environmental working group puts out a list every year of the dirty dozen and the clean 15. Highly recommend getting on there if you're not familiar with organic and at least start purchasing that dirty dozen organically. Best place to start. It's not going to break the bank. And then as you feel comfortable doing that, just start going to more and more organic foods because people want to fight this one too. But yes, there are studies showing that organic is you're getting fewer pesticides, herbicides, and all those things that are going to build up in your body. So in the short term, it might be a little more expensive, but in the long run, we promise you, you are saving some money. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. You're definitely speaking our language. There's a guy I love, Laird Hamilton, big wave surfer, probably seen him. People ask him, man, he's 50 something years old. looks like a Greek God. So what is your secret? I eat plants and animals. Yep. And it's really that simple, you know? It is. It's so simple. Yeah. So going back to the uh, the mold, is there a, um, so I'm not finished, I almost forgot, but I wanted to ask about <laughs> the test or the name of the test. Like um, she had a test done, but it we really didn't know if it was giving her the results that we were um, hoping to see, or I mean, is there a blood test? What type of test is done? What's the name of that? And how do people get a test for mold if it is in their body? Yeah, that gets a little bit tricky. Those aren't the tests that I run. That's where I would defer to my functional MD. And that's where I'd say, find somebody that specializes in mold toxicity. Mm-hmm. Most people are trained by Dr. Shoemaker. If you've heard of him, he's kind of the mold guru. Not everyone follows him to a T, but they start with his training. Um, There are some blood tests like the HLA gene to see if you're more prone to having mold stay in your body. Um, And there's a few other blood tests that they run. There are also some now that you can do like Great Plain Labs um, has one. I think it's the, it's a mycotoxin test. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it, it kind of points you in that direction. And then even if people are questioning mold, there's um, Great Plains Lab also has an organic acids test. And there are certain markers that you can be looking for to see if that mold is in your body. All right. Thank Mm -hmm. you. So once you find that out, so let's say you find that you have mold in your your body, then the next step would be to find a specialist like you and to create a diet that will help them create that safe way of binding the toxins and removing from their body and also removing what's, you know, the cause of it, right? Correct. I was going to say that. Absolutely. Where is the mold coming from? How are you being exposed? That's number one. Yeah. And unfortunately it's usually in the home, but we've seen a lot of cases where it's in the office. Mm. A lot of people working in moldy schools. That was actually my situation was teaching in a moldy school Schools are very prone to mold. Um, Hotel rooms are also very prone to mold just because they're thrown up so fast. Um, Yeah, so it's it's finding where that mold is coming from, and it takes a little bit of digging. Even cars. You can even find cars. Cars are another one. 
Uh-huh. Absolutely. And you can start to smell it in cars at least, but <laughs> Well, the thing is, when you have kids, you don't know the difference in between the sounds. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it all smells bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, what do you? How do you help people? What do you? What is your like day to day? You know, activity. What do you do to help people? I mean, it depends on where their starting journey is. You know, a lot of people come to me with digestive issues and autoimmune disease. People that have not been helped. People like myself what I used to look like. You've tried everything, you're fed up, you're not getting any answers. And so you're starting to think there's got to be another way. I need to figure out why my body is failing and what's causing this. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on where they're starting from. I have some clients that come to me not knowing much of anything. And that's great. I actually think that's a wonderful place to start because we can really dive into diet and I can educate them on what is nourishing, what's depleting your body, we're looking at chemicals in the home, in the environment, and things like that, versus other people who come to me very well educated. They've tried autoimmune paleo, they've tried FODMAPs, SCD, GAPS. I mean, they've tried all these therapeutic diets, and they're still not getting answers, but that's because perhaps they've not done any type of functional lab work. So they're just going to Western medicine, they're looking at their labs, they're being told, everything's within range, you look great, mm -hmm. and sent on their way. And I see that all too often. So that's when we look at, okay, what makes the most sense for you? What's going on in your body? Where are your symptoms residing? How are things connected? Should we run some functional labs to see what else is going on? And then usually we're getting some answers and a starting point. So maybe diet was already perfect. Then we're talking about where are these toxins coming from? We're digging a lot and we're really getting into that person's story and that's one way that functional medicine, in my opinion, is really advanced because conventional medicine will spend about 10 minutes with you on average, I think. And they don't understand your story. They just know your symptoms and that's it. You're sent on your way. But they're not digging to find out, well, what happened to you five years ago? What was your life like 10 years ago? Wait, you had a high period of stress with three deaths in your family 15 years ago and that's when your symptoms started? Like, there's a connection there and we need to understand the story for each person because we're all so different. Yeah. The uh, MDs that we've talked to that have gone the way of functional integrative health, they've probably either had a family member that they've told us about or themselves got sick. And it's so sad that we've gotten to this point that, like you said, 10 minutes when you go see the doctor and five of those minutes are with the nurse probably. It's like, no, 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 gone. And here's your prescription. You know, yeah. It's like, how, how did we get there? <laughs> I know. Well, and even with lab work, like no one questions. I want to know what's going on in my body. I realize it's only a snapshot in time. But when I get that blood work drawn, I want to see what my levels look like. I want to track. Is my cholesterol going up? Is it going down? How does my glucose look? Like all those little sciencey things that kind of make me a nerd. I want to see what's happening in my body. And I think that everyone should be looking at those but what's happening is people aren't even getting copies of those. They're just being given a phone call. Everything looks good and that's it. But in reality, you can get ahead of disease. If you see something like a glucose level just going up by two every year, you're headed for diabetes. Like it's so important to look at your lab work, save it, track it and see what's going on and look for those patterns. I love what you just said because I had two instances. One of the things is that we don't feel safe. I don't feel safe talking to Western doctors anymore. Yeah. The last one I talked to uh, when I report that I was having brain fogs, he wanted to report me to the DMV. <sighs> and um, I, I asked him, is this a symptom that a pregnant woman usually has? And he said, yeah. I said, so you haven't done any tests to see if I'm pregnant. And at that moment, I felt scared. And that was the last time I said, I, this is the last time I'm going to a Western doctor. Because we need to feel safe, you know, to talk and validate it too about your symptoms. And I think this is where function, functional medicine comes in. Understanding, as you're saying, the history and what triggered, when was the last time you felt good? When, you know, when do you feel the worst? When do you feel the best? And it's got to start connecting the dots because it's really about caring. And um, about the results, 
yes. They, the doctors, I don't think they even look at the results because when I was pregnant, um, the doctor didn't look at any of my results, my labs. And when I was delivering the baby, I wanted to have a normal delivery. She comes and she says that, oh, by the way, I missed um, your... Um, the gestational diabetes gestational. indicator was right near getting into the bad area. <laughs> and she should have looked because the, the, the lab's mark were different than the hospital's mark for levels of normal. And she didn't see that. She just saw that the day of when I was delivering the baby. Wow. So that could have been a huge issue for both of us. So that's the day that I took responsibility on my labs and I read every single, I want the results. I want to see what's going on. And I Google to see, <laughs> you know, what does that even means? So yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's a very important uh, topic for us to be discussing, you know, like how we take control of our own health. And I think that's so important. Conventional medicine doesn't necessarily love that. They don't like when informed people come in. And I can't speak for all, not all are like that, but more and more people are becoming informed. And I think that's how it should be. It should be a dual conversation between practitioner and patient. Like, yes, you should know what's going on in your body. And yes, the doctor or practitioner should have some insight, but together decisions need to be made. It shouldn't just be one person saying, go do this. And that's it. I think that both there needs to be an understanding of what's going on in the body and there needs to be some joint agreement in the treatment plan and what needs to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it was, oh my gosh, I got so much good information. Thank you so much for sharing all of that yeah. with us <laughs> and with the audience. And you have a special treat for everybody, right? I do. So I have a five day meal plan. So for those I was going to say for those dealing with the toxin burden, but let's be honest, that's every single one of us. It really is. Um, even those of us that feel like we've tried to eliminate everything, there's still stuff I'm exposed to that I can't control. Um, so I have a five day meal plan. It's vegetarian. Okay. So I'll be honest. I'm not a vegetarian. I eat meat. If you want to add meat in, you can, but I wanted this to be something that was truly cleansing to the body. Just taking some ease, some burden off, um, especially if you're not purchasing the highest quality of meats, I'd rather you avoid those. So just a vegetarian based five day meal plan, breakfast, lunch, dinners, give yourself a five day break, take off some of that toxic burden. I've done all the work for you. Just, you know, take the shopping list with you to the grocery store and you're set for five days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then rinse and repeat. You just do it the next and the next. Every so often. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That would be wonderful. Thank you. That's yeah. a very valuable tool. Yeah, thank you so much. And I will be sharing that gift uh, with the audience. Great. Well, thank you, guys. It was such a pleasure talking to you, Kira, and I hope you have an amazing day. Thank you. And thank you for getting this information out to everyone because it really is so needed. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing.